so this was a church which had uh, different ethnic background people, uh, different religious background people, and Jews had a relationship with God that went back thousands of years. They knew the law of God, which they didn't always do very well at keeping. The Gentiles, on the other hand, didn't have the same kind of relationship with God. They, they didn't know his law. Uh, they didn't have that same connection that they had with, with the Lord. However, both of these groups had something in common. And that thing in common is that both of these groups had entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it was on the basis of this relationship with Jesus Christ that they had a right relationship with God. It was on the basis of what Jesus had done on the cross that these two groups could be in the same church, different backgrounds, yet on the same standing with God, righteous. They were righteous not because, well, the Jews had worked out how to do the law thing. They were righteous not because somehow the Gentiles had worked out how to do good things. No, they were righteous because of Jesus Christ. And in fact, Paul makes a very clear statement. He says, actually, all of you guys, you fall short of the glory of God. In other words, you don't actually honor God the way that you are supposed to. Because of your sin, because of your sin, which is your failure to meet the requirements of God, you all fall short. And the good news is because of the grace of God in Jesus Christ, because of God's mercy, actually you can still be in relationship with God on the basis of Jesus Christ. And this, this reality of, um, of God's mercy and God's grace is is skillfully and convincingly it's developed and it's communicated in the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans when we get to chapter 12 Paul moves into looking more deeply at the implications of God's mercy for practical Christian living this is what God's mercy has done this is what his grace has done it's made you righteous. You're accepted by God through Christ. Well, in view of God's mercy, what does Christian life look like? And in the first verse of Romans 12, this is what he says. Therefore, therefore, in light of chapters 1 to 11, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. The proper response to the mercy of God was for the Romans to do what? To live a sacrificial life for God. To live to please God. And if they did this, they were actually worshiping him a life that pleases god is worship we've sang songs worship we've given money worship you're going to leave here and do some other stuff this morning worship if it pleases god worship that is the true that is the proper response What applied to them applies to us. And this sacrificial life doesn't just affect the relationship with God. It also affects the relationship with each other. And that's what we'll be looking at this morning. As we go into Romans chapter 12... Paul then speaks about spiritual gifts. 
the gifts of the Holy Spirit that God has given to different people in the church to serve each other. And he explains, this is what it looks like when you use those gifts in a worshipful way. This is what it looks like when you use those gifts in a sacrificial way, in the context of a spiritual community. You've got that gift, gift of mercy, gift of leadership, gift of generosity, different gifts, gift of leadership, mentions different gifts and says, hey, in light of God's mercy, this is how those different gifts will work themselves out. And it's in the context of that that he then takes them to the issue of honor. But before getting to the issue of honor, Paul speaks about love. Paul was concerned that the Romans exercised their gifts in a context of love. God's mercy calls you to live sacrificial lives, sacrificial lives in the way you use your gifts, use your gifts in an atmosphere of love. And it's in that atmosphere of love that we then get to this issue of how we honor each other. Paul was concerned about the way love and spiritual gifts worked together. We see this also in his letter to the Corinthians, his first letter, because 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we call that the what? The, the love passage or the love chapter. It's classic instruction on how to live as a people of love. But that chapter is sandwiched between two chapters on spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14, in the middle, kind of holding this together, is love. And Paul has an interest with the Romans getting that same thinking, that yes, spiritual gifts, but in the context with the atmosphere of love. So let's move down to verses 9 and 10 of Romans chapter 12, and let's see what the implications of God's mercy are with regards to honor in our relationships with each other. Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves. Striking, isn't it, that honor goes with love. Before exhorting the Romans to honor each other, Paul exhorts them to love one another. And he says to them that this love must be sincere. Sincere simply means real. This love must be authentic. It must be genuine. You know, it's, it's easy for me to say, I love you. Those three words, they, they come off our lips quite easily, don't they? And the more we watch TV and so on, it's like, man, it's, it's so easy to just say, I love you. But when Paul says that um, love must be sincere, he's saying it needs to go beyond just words. It needs to be real. It actually needs to be seen. Can this love be seen? Is it genuine? Where there is real love, there will be honor. I can say I love you, but can that love be seen by its actions? Can the love we claim to have be seen by hating what is evil. 
Can the love we claim to have be seen by clinging to what is good? After instructing the Romans to have this sincere love, Paul says, hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Now, this could stand on its own as a separate, mighty instruction. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. It does, however, seem to fit quite well as an explanation of what this sincere love should look like. When we talk of a love-hate relationship, that's usually a negative thing, isn't it? It's like, man, I have a love-hate relationship with that person. It's like one minute I love them, the next minute I hate them. And because we're human, sometimes it feels like that. God, however, really does want us to be temperate, doesn't he? He wants us to be kind of stable and not swinging up and down and back and forth. Love-hate. In this situation here, the love-hate relationship is actually not a negative thing. Because the two go well together. It's let your love be sincere. Great, positive thing. And at the same time, well, hate what is evil. Great. Let's do those two things together. They're not contradicting each other. Love, hate, love, hate. No, it's, man, sincere love, hate evil. They actually complement each other. They go well together. If I love you, I should hate anything evil that could happen to you. If I love you, if there's anything evil that would come your way, either through me, because I have a wicked heart, or through someone else, because we all have wicked hearts, I should hate that thing. I should be like, man, I, 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 I don't want to see any evil happen to you. That, that's, that's a sincere love. Cling to what is good. This word cling, it carries the sense of gluing yourself. Joining yourself. This is good. Yeah, it gets clumsy sometimes, doesn't it? Doing what's good, eh? It's hard. But I don't want to be. I don't want to be disconnected to good. Wherever good is, I want to be there. I'm going to go with good, because I want to be clinged to what is good. If if I love you, then what I want for you is good. I'm going to cling to it. I'm going to be glued to it. It's going to be stuck to me good. That's my desire for you. That's what I'm going to work out in my life for you. Good. Because I love you. So we say we love each other. Well, if we love each other, as we relate with one another, it's, man, I, I'm going to hate evil and I'm going to cling to what is good. I'm going to be joined, glued to what is good on your behalf. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, is sandwiched between two exhortations about love, which is why it seems to fit quite well as unpacking what love should look like. Paul goes on to say, be devoted to one another in love. Where there is devotion, that is where you will find honor. And this devotion is like the affection that you have between brothers. It's like that, that family affection, the bond between brothers, the bond between siblings. And that shouldn't surprise us even that the church, the primary metaphor for the church in, in the Bible is it's a family. 
So we shouldn't be surprised if, if, if Paul is saying, guys, have, have a devotion, a commitment to each other, which is like this brotherly affection. Like the, like the stuff you see in a family. That's how you should be devoted to each other. That's how you should be close. That's how you should care for one another. It's like this brotherly thing. That's how connected I want you guys to be. You're a family. And then after laying this foundation of love, Paul then gives his attention to honor. He says, honor one another above yourselves. It's just five words. Five words, but boy, five powerful words. Honor one another above yourselves. Now, as we read this instruction, you could imagine three different scenarios. You could say, Paul, I have a scenario. My scenario is this. I want to honor myself above others. How about that, Paul? Mm -mm. Although, to be honest, isn't that the natural human response? Our human nature says, I want to honor myself above others. So, Paul, actually, I, I have a suggestion for you. I want to be honoring myself above others. To swallow, so I'm just going to go for what I think is fair. And what I think is fair is another scenario, which is let's honor each other the same. The way you honor me, I will honor you. The way I honor you, you honor me. So it's just kind of equal. Isn't that fair? And if you're a justice person in here this morning, you're thinking, yeah, I, I think I like that. It's, it's fair, it's just, it's equal. But Paul doesn't go for just, he doesn't go for fair, he doesn't go for equal. Paul goes for the most difficult scenario possible. He says, honor others, honor each other above yourselves. Wow, Paul, do you, do you get this community? This is a community where we've come from different ethnic backgrounds. This is a community where we've come from different religious backgrounds. The potential for misunderstanding is huge, Paul. The potential for not honoring each other is pretty big. And then throw in there our human nature, our sinful nature. Are you serious? You're saying we should honor each other above ourselves? Are you serious? And Paul's like, yep, that's the standard. That's the standard for the church. And then it, it just makes sense to us why he starts the chapter with this whole thing of <laughs> encouraging us to live sacrificial lives. We started with, in view of God's mercy, hey, live sacrificially. And you're like, of course. It makes sense. If, if I'm going to live a sacrificial life, that's the only way I can get to this. If I don't live a sacrificial life, if I don't sacrifice this, there's no way I can get to a place where I honor others above myself. Our human nature wants the honor. It doesn't want to give it. It wants to take it. But when we consider God's mercy... God's mercy empowers us to honor others above ourselves. The fact that Jesus Christ, who is fully God, was willing to be dishonored for me, to be dishonored for you. The fact that he was willing to leave heaven. 
He was willing to come and live a humble life on earth. He was willing to come and face rejection. Jesus Christ was willing to die a brutal death on the cross. That empowers us to honor others above ourselves. When we consider Jesus' humility, we can also have humility and we can honor others above ourselves. Friends, honor is a gospel issue. It's a gospel issue. The gospel is the life of Jesus Christ, the teachings of Christ, the works of Christ. His death, his resurrection, his forgiveness of our sins through what he did on the cross. Honor is a gospel issue. And we say that we are a gospel-centered church. We say that we love the gospel. We have given ourselves to living out the gospel and growing in the gospel. If that is the case, we should be living out and growing in honor because honor is a gospel issue. To honor means to give value to someone. To honor means to treat someone with dignity. It means to respect someone. And that is what others should be receiving from us. Value. Oh man, I, I, I value you. I, I place dignity on you. I respect you. But it doesn't end there. It says that that should happen above yourselves. And that, that, that phrase, above yourselves, it means to prefer. I prefer you. When it comes to honor, I prefer you. Here I am. And here are you. I have a choice. I can either put more value on me, or I can put more value on you. Honor says, Sheshi, put more value on them. And the beauty of it is we come into that as children of God. Already so valued. You, you can't be more valued than as a child of God. It's like you're, you, you've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You're part of the family of God. You have the right to be called a child of God because you've believed in Jesus. You have great honor. You have great value already. So as as you enter into that decision, it's like, man, I am secure in who I am as a child of God. So when I then make a choice to honor you, I'm not losing any value before God. It's like, man, God sees me as his son, as his daughter anyway. But I'm going to consider you of greater value. I'm going to esteem you. I'm going to respect you. I'm going to place dignity on you. How are we doing with honoring each other? How are we actually doing with honoring each other above ourselves? Remember we said that the context is that Paul was 
telling them how to use their spiritual gifts in a sacrificial, worshipful way. So an immediate application for us is to say, with those that we use our spiritual gifts with, as we serve alongside others, here in, at God's tribe, or you might be serving alongside others in a different context using the gifts that God's given you, how is the honor thing working in that situation? We believe in small groups here at God's tribe. We want every member of God's tribe to be in a, what we call a life group. That's another context where, you know, we can work out our gifts and use them. We've actually just started a life group in our area. We live in Boko. So last week we've kicked off. If you're out that way, Boko, Bunjue, Karibusana to that new life group. But even there, that's another context, isn't it, where we can use our gifts and come together. And, and how are we honoring each other in that situation? In the ministry you're in, in the prayer meeting that you attend, how is honor going in your marriage if you're married? Because truth is, your spiritual gifts are seen at their best or their worst sometimes in the context of marriage. How's it going with your kids? If you have kids. What's the honor dynamic in these different relationships that we find ourselves in? Is there an honoring of each other. Man, I, I, I place value on you above myself. Or is it actually it's, it's about me? Things need to kind of go my way. I have the gifts. I have the power. What, what can we do this week? This week, what can we do to honor someone in those different contexts? Just appreciate and just show honor to them. To honor them above ourselves. You know, perhaps the Holy Spirit has been pointing out areas in your life where you're not showing honor as you should and what we should do when the Holy Spirit convicts us the Bible says that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin well, what we should do when that conviction comes is we should repent which means we should change our minds about those things we should turn away and and we should start to live differently we should receive grace afresh. We should receive mercy afresh. If we are really going to live as living sacrifices, daily thing, everyday thing, we need mercy and grace daily. It's not like I received mercy and grace five years ago, I'm good. We need the mercy of God and the grace of God to be changing us all the time. Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, I want you to be strong in grace. When you find yourself getting weak in grace, weak in mercy, man, be strong in grace. So we can receive grace because as we receive grace, it's when I receive grace that I can then go and give grace. I can then go and give honor. We 
boldly come to the throne of God as his children. And we receive his mercy. We receive his grace. You might be facing something different. Perhaps you are feeling afresh the hurt of being the one who was dishonored. Some of us are feeling, hey, I, I can do better to honor. Some of us are feeling the wound of, man, I've, I think I was dishonored. And we need to forgive. And there's mercy and grace for that as well. The Bible says that forgive because you have been forgiven. It's because you've received grace that you can give grace. This instruction on honor, it's similar to what Paul tells the Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. A moment ago, I said that honor has to do with the value that you give to someone. And what's Paul saying here to the Philippians? He's saying, value others above yourselves. Something very similar to what he said to the church in Rome. Value others above yourselves. And if we read on in Philippians chapter 2, as to what Paul's motivation is, he says... It's to have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. In other words, the reason you are to value others above yourselves is to imitate Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ left the glory of heaven, the majesty of heaven, took on human flesh, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He came and suffered even to the point of death on a cross. So he's saying, have the mindset of Christ. That's your motivation for honoring others above yourselves. We're coming into land now. You know, I absolutely love this church. I think this church is amazing. Even with all its brokenness, and I am a big part of that brokenness. But I do think that we could be an even more amazing church if we took Paul's words seriously. If we were serious and said, wow, God is calling us to respond to the gospel. Honor is a gospel issue. Honor shows Christ to my brothers and sisters and I'm going to do my very best through the grace of God, through the mercy of God, I'm going to do my very best to be someone who honors others above myself. What kind of church would we be? Oh my goodness. Amazing. So my encouragement to us, could I ask the worship team to come up and give us some background music now just to help us as we transition 
into responding. My encouragement to us, brothers and sisters, is to honor. I just want you to turn to the person next to you and say, I want to honor you. I want to honor you. I see you have no one next to you. I want to honor you. As I was praying this morning, just thinking about, Lord, how do you want us to respond? What do you want us to do with this? And I think there's already been some application, different people that we can do, perhaps God's put some people in our heads, in our hearts. I just felt God say that even this morning, I... I want you to ask the people sitting here that if they can see anyone in this room, that they haven't honored. That they would just go to that person. It's just between them and they would just reach out and say, whatever it is that they feel led to say. I just felt that, yeah, I said, God, are you sure? That's, that sounds pretty, ooh, right here? Yeah, I felt God say, yeah, right here. If In the moment, as, as the Holy Spirit in our hearts, if, if you can just think now, man, there's a brother here, there's a sister here, there's someone just realize I haven't quite honored them the way, the way I should have, and I just want to make right with that. I just want to invite you to go across to that person, just have a conversation. The other thing I felt the Holy Spirit say was, um, for some of us, it's the other side, isn't it? It's, well, I feel... I feel I've been dishonored. I'm the one who's carrying the... I just felt God say, well, for that person, man, they can... They can just reach out to that person who's done that. Just say, hey, you know what? I just feel like there's something between us. I just wanted to talk to you about that. And it could actually be the person next to you. Maybe it's, it's your spouse. Maybe it's your good friend. Maybe it's someone else. But I don't want to be awkward this morning. I just want to respond to what God is prompting. So if that's you, if you feel led to a brother, a sister, a friend this morning, we're not going to all eyes on them. Oh, what's going on there? That's not the heart of it. Each of us is guilty of something here. Each of us needs to look at the log in our own eyes before we can even look at the speck in our brother or sisters. So even as these guys play, just give you an opportunity to respond that way.
você sofre. Lord, thank you that you want us to be a people of honor. often we want the honor for ourselves and we don't want to give it to anyone else Lord please from this day on make us a people that are growing in honoring others above ourselves we know it is against our human nature it is against our pride it is against our ambition and we can never do it in our own strength so God please help us may they be a true culture of honor in this community and Lord thank you that it has to start with love Lord love without honor is kind of weak and just mushy and honor without love is kind of stiff and regimented and harsh Lord, we pray that we would have love, true love. And on the basis of that, we can have true honor. Honor that is in the likeness of Jesus. The same mindset as Christ, who humbled himself and gave himself for us. God, as we continue in this series, continue to grow us, to teach us. I pray for conversations this week that will move us forward as a people of honor. In Jesus' name.